Hey, it's Mike from Go Cell Phone Repair, and today I want to answer some questions about the repair business. So I'm going to try to do this at least once a week, just kind of take a very common question and answer it here in video format. It's much easier than just typing out tons and tons of information. So um, before I do that, though, I do want to read my favorite comment of the week. This thing had me laughing. I don't know why this struck me so funny, but I love it. It says, stupid, you don't even know how to do anything. Emoji poop five times, angry face three times. Now, I don't know how I rate five emoji poops and only three angry faces, and I'm not even really sure if this person was talking to me or another comment in the thread, but it just struck me as really funny, so uh, congratulations, you have the best comment of the week. I absolutely love it. Even if you were talking to me, I can take criticism, no problem, and I mean, I don't know how to do everything, but I know how to do a few things. <music> So uh, when it comes to getting into the phone repair business, I get this question a lot. Is this something that I should do? You know, um, is it still going to be worth it? Or am I going to make a lot of money? Is it going to be too difficult for me and so forth? So really, I want to answer a bunch of questions. And before I do that, just so you don't think I'm making this stuff up as I go along, I do want to give you a little bit of my background. So I've been working in the phone repair industry since 1994. Back then, most of my certifications came from companies like Motorola, Nokia, NEC. Obviously, manufacturers don't grant too many certifications anymore for people outside of their company. So things have changed quite a bit, you know, in addition to the way that phones have evolved. And I'm not saying that that makes me the expert on everything. In fact, if someone were going to be working on my phone, I would probably be more interested in knowing what they've been doing for the last two years rather than what they did 20 years ago. But I'm hoping that the experiences that I've had over the last 22 years will be helpful to anyone who's interested about this industry and um, is thinking about getting involved in it. So should you get into the phone repair business? Now, the first question I usually ask people is, is this going to be something that you enjoy doing? So I can tell you right now, I definitely wouldn't be doing the same thing for 22 years, you know, given other choices, if I wasn't at some level enjoying what I do. And the thing about most industries is that uh, they may seem like fun in the beginning, but once you start collecting a paycheck for something, once you get paid to do something, it does become a little more like work and a little less like fun. So there's always that element to it. But beyond that, there are a lot of things that you should ask yourself about your personality type, your abilities, your dedication, and so forth to decide whether you really want to get into this because it's not something like, um, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to, de you know, make anyone feel like their job isn't valuable. So I don't want to say if you do this, it's really easy to get into, but there are a lot of jobs that you can get into at entry level that you may end up enjoying more than this one. In my case, satisfaction comes from not only collecting a paycheck or getting paid, but also from helping people. So if you find it very rewarding to solve problems, I would say that this would be uh, more likely something that you might consider getting involved in. Another thing I like about this job is that if you choose to, and what I do is I work by appointment, so I don't have a set schedule where I go in and I work you know, uh, business hours Monday through Saturday or anything like that. I kind of... Um, contract with people who want to hire me to do repair services or training services. I do a few things through the mail. I don't do a whole lot of repairs from my home. I have a workbench set up here in case I need to, but for the most part when I'm working, it's inside of a repair facility somewhere. So the cool thing is that if you choose to go with an appointment only type deal, you can say, okay, I'm going to be available for these days of the week and not these days of the week. And you can kind of work around, you know, any type of uh, scheduling you might have. Let's say you're going to school, you have kids, you know, you have another schedule that you have to work out with your uh, significant other or whatever it is. So that's kind of cool. The flexibility I really do enjoy. And that's the thing that kind of changes when you get into a brick and mortar situation, because if you're working in a cell phone repair store, your hours have to fit the public needs. So you've kind of got to be there all the time or at least pay someone there to be there for you, which is um, another topic that I'll get into later on. But getting people to do your job when you start this business is going to be one of the more challenging aspects of growing or scaling a phone repair business. So the first question that kind of came up when we started doing phone repair training is aren't you going to create a lot of competition for your own company? And to an extent, you know, there's a degree of truthfulness to that, but here's why I tell anyone who's interested in this industry not to worry too much about competition. And while it is a factor, it's not going to be what makes or breaks you and let, you know, outside of very extreme uh, situations. So 
One thing about competition is that they have to get their information somewhere. And I can tell you that, you know, doing my best job of taking the information that I have kind of gained, you know, the knowledge that I've gained during my time in the phone repair industry and giving that information to someone else is one thing, but getting anyone, uh, you know, no matter who it is, typically a business owner or someone who's getting into this business to follow that information to the letter, you know, to follow those directions to the letter is far more difficult than you can possibly imagine. And it's not a limitation of their comprehension or their abilities. It's more along the lines of, well, I see that you've been doing this for a long time and you're telling me I should do it this way, but I'm going to kind of cherry pick the things that I agree with and then do a whole bunch of other stuff that I think is going to be better for my business. And, you know, I can, I'm not going to sit back and say, Hey, I know what's best for your business, but I can tell you that I've seen this happen over and over again. You give someone the full instruction manual, you know, here is how to create a successful phone repair business. And you can follow up with them a few months later and see exactly what they have chosen to follow as far as the directions are and what they've kind of just either forgotten about or said, well, you know, I don't really agree with that. I'm going to do it differently. And then a little later down the line, they come to the realization that, well, I should have done this in the first place or it becomes their idea. You know, they, they said, oh, you know what? I've decided that this is the best thing for their business. And you can say, well, I told you that in the beginning, but you know, what's the point really? Um, in some cases, it has to be their own idea. So I leave that up to the interpretation of the person who is considering getting into this business. If you think you know business and you want to run it your way, that's fine. But by all means, you know, continue to do what works for you and eliminate the stuff that's costing you money or not making you money or wasting your time because time is money in this business. So what does it take to get started? What's it going to cost? Well, that's one that's a little more difficult to answer. But the short answer, if there is one, is that if you want to decide first what it is you're going to be repairing, get your tools, your replacement parts, and some practice phones to work on, you will definitely want to practice working on devices that you're not afraid of damaging. So you can accomplish this in a couple of ways, and I would recommend you do both. One is to buy some devices that you can work on in your spare time and not have to have the pressure of it needs to be done in a certain amount of time and not have to worry about breaking someone's phone or anything like that. Uh, if you're doing really basic repairs like screen replacement, you shouldn't have to worry about that for the most part, you know, with common devices like iPhones. But outside of that, if you want to dig deeper into this, you need to have a lot of hands-on experience and really know the inside of the phone before you start taking it from customers and saying, okay, I'll be done with this in 30 minutes and everything's going to be working fine. Also, if you end up at a phone repair facility, you should end up with the opportunity of working on a wide variety of current devices that are on the market. So uh, one thing that I recommend to people, and I don't just want to pitch my training, that's not what this uh, video is about whatsoever, but I do tell people when they call me, you know, look at the reputation of the training facility that you're going to and make sure that they're teaching you how to fix the phones that will be coming into your store or that you'll be seeing on your desk the first day you open for business. You don't want to go learn how to repair flip phones and then tomorrow someone brings you an iPhone 7 or a Galaxy S7. You know, there's two different things and there's really not a lot to be gained by working on a phone that's five or six years old, you know, with rare exceptions. So make sure that you have access to these phones and that you really get to go through an entire tear down, rebuild, diagnostic step so that you know that when you open up your store, when you go into business, that you're going to be working with the same devices that you've already got real life experience on. And this is one of the areas where people often say, well, you know, can't I just watch a YouTube video? Well, in some cases, absolutely. You can watch YouTube videos and you can learn a lot from YouTube videos. Um, the, the thing that you're really going to gain from taking a real training course is the feedback that you get from a qualified instructor. So you want someone who can watch what you're doing and say, you know, um, that might have worked out okay this time, but if you continue with this type of practice, you're going to have problems. And this is where you get to the point where you're going to not just make money, but save money by being qualified to do what you do. Because the first time you break someone's $800 phone, obviously that's going to set you back quite a bit. Not only the cost of the equipment or the stress that you're going to feel when this customer is upset with you because you lost the information on their phone, but also the reputation that you're building from day one. So every time you have a positive interaction with the customer, there's a possibility that they may come back or they may tell someone else about the good job that you did. But the first time that you have a negative experience with the customer, they are going to tell everyone they know in many cases. So that's kind of how a lot of businesses work. You know, you only hear the people who are having problems. 
So uh, it's one of those things you have to get used to, but hopefully prevent by being prepared in the first place. So at this point in time, we offer a basic cell phone repair course. And I recommend that anyone who isn't already working in the industry to take this course before they go any further than that. A lot of people wanna jump into the most advanced level training there is, and if you don't have the foundation for the most common repairs that you're gonna be seeing, there's no reason to be doing this really high-tech stuff that you're that are gonna be you know few and far between, where when somebody brings you uh, an LG and says, hey, I need to get a new screen replaced on this thing, if you have no experience with that phone, you know, but you can do LCD refurbishment, well, that's not gonna help you out. You need to be able to start with the basics. And with this basic foundation, you should be able to go in a multitude of directions, which I'll talk about a little bit later in the video also. Can anyone get into the phone repair business? Well, I get this question a lot and the answer is no, not anyone. And for probably not the reasons that you think. So when people call me up, and ask about training, I actually do the best job that I can to qualify them to make sure that this is gonna be a good investment for them. Because the last thing I want is for someone to show up and pay me money to teach them how to do something that they are not qualified to do, or something that they're not realistically going to end up doing and make a profit from it. You know, if they said, hey, I wanna come in and pay for your course for entertainment, I'd say, sure, pull up a chair, you're welcome to come in, come in anytime. But most people come in with the expectation that they are gonna get something out of this course that is going to enable them to make money, a lot more money than they invested in the training. So I want to make sure that they have a clear understanding of what to expect and what is gonna be required from them in order to complete the training. So the first questions that I usually ask people is what kind of vision they have, if their hand is steady, and if they have the patience and persistence to continue working on things that don't always seem to want to cooperate with you. So the best analogy that I've come up with for eyesight is this. If you've ever threaded a sewing needle before, this will give you an idea of what you're gonna be able to have to focus on up close. And we work with a lot of very small parts and we work with them very up close. So if you have any issues that deal with anything that you're working with up close to your face, you have to make sure that there's a way to correct that. A lot of people wear reading glasses, prescription lenses, contacts, whatever it is, but anything, you know, if you're reading a bottle of pills this close with a prescription on the back of it and that tiny print and you can't see what it says, you need to have corrective lenses that allow you to see that because a lot of the things that we're gonna be dealing with are going to be that small, seriously. Not only do you need to be able to see what you're doing, but you need to be able to maneuver your hands, your tools and your parts in and out of these small areas. So some of these screws that we work with are literally about the size of the letters on a dime. So if you can't thread a screw at that size, there's not really a lot of uh, training that I can give you that will help you to overcome that challenge. So I recommend that people make sure that they are comfortable working with things on that scale. And I will give them some examples if they call up and say, you know, well, I don't have uh, a needle and thread on hand. Well, you can go get one or you can go and buy a very cheap phone, take it apart and get an idea of what's on the inside so that you can understand what that concept means. If they're in the area, I invite them to come by the store and we'll pull out a phone and set it down in front of them and say, okay, here's what you wanna do, put these screws in here. And if you can't do that, you are going to struggle. It's not only gonna be difficult for you, but it's gonna be very difficult for the rest of the class because we have to move as slow as the slowest student. So we wanna make sure that everyone's kind of on the uh, same general skill level or has the same aptitude to move at the same pace as you know the majority of the class. Patience is a big one. You have got to not only be able to go through a number of steps from A through Z, but you have to be able to stop and back up a few steps or do some research, go on Google, pull up a video. You've got to have access to the information that's going to help you get past any stumbling blocks you might run into during a repair. So uh, if you're the type of person who loses their patience, if you've got a short fuse, this is probably not a good job for you. And uh, while I think that most people can assimilate the information in the training, they will understand how we go about diagnosing and repairing phones. Not everyone can get to the point where they are able to duplicate that same process because of these factors, mainly hand-eye coordination and eyesight and patience. So again, if you feel like those are any problem, gonna be problems for you, I don't recommend that you come to the training. I don't recommend you go to anyone's training uh, get a hold of some phones, try it out for yourself, see what the frustration level is and if you're comfortable working with those parts and then decide if you want to pursue this as a career. By the way, phones are pretty nasty. In fact, a lot of the ones that we work on came 
from the customer out of the toilet into their hands and then to us. So that's what you're gonna be working with a lot of the times, not to mention that just phones in general are probably the dirtiest things that you have uh, you know, in your possession. They're out in the open being handled, being exposed to elements, you're putting it right by your face. I mean, all day long there are germs going into your phone and when you hand me your phone, it's not my germs, those are your germs and vice versa. So if that makes you uncomfortable, it's definitely something you wanna consider because this is what you will be working with every single day. Is now a good time to get into the phone repair business? Now this has been coming up a lot more lately because people are seeing all these repair shops spring up. You know, if you go, if you live anywhere, you can probably find a phone repair store. And if you live in certain areas, you can probably find a whole lot of phone repair stores. So. I would have to say that is, you know, if someone said, is this as good a time to get into the business as it was five years ago? Probably not, depending on your situation. There's definitely gonna be more competition. The market has become more saturated. Uh, you'll have to deal with a lot of people who are aware of that. And, you know, in that case, you can't really pick and choose a lot of the repairs that you do because you are no longer going to be the only game in town. So uh, with that in mind, I still believe that anyone who is dedicated to success and understands customer service and gets the technical part of this and who is willing to work hard, yes, you can absolutely get into the phone repair business and now is as good a time as you know last year. Again, like I said, probably not as good a time as five years ago because there are companies that have been established for that time period and in many cases, you might have to compete with them. And that's kind of like, you know, you're the new guy in town trying to trying to establish your reputation and move up. It's not impossible, but it will be challenging. Now, the exception to that rule that I've observed and that I've gotten feedback from people who I've trained is when you live in an area that does not have a large population. So it appears, and this makes sense, that the larger, popula more densely populated areas in the country are becoming saturated the fastest. You know, if you go to San Francisco, Las Vegas, uh, Austin, Texas, Chicago, a lot of these larger cities do have a high, uh, a very high degree of competition. But if you move into an area where there are 50, 60,000 people, maybe even 100,000 people and not much around for the next, you know, 10 or 15 miles, if you were to open a phone repair store in a situation where there was no other phone repair store within 20 minutes, you could be in a really good position. In fact, uh, it could be just like opening up a phone store from you know the beginning, you know, ten years ago, when uh, people just started getting into really you know working on handsets uh, on a on a higher on a bigger scale. Other than that, if you're in a big city, you can absolutely expect a lot of competition and proximity to. Uh, other phone stores is going to make a big difference. So if I'm in a big city like San Francisco and there's a phone repair store across the street from me and there's a phone repair store two miles from where I'm at, I'd have to have a really good reason not to go to the guy that's right across the street. So, uh, you know, geography is going to be a factor, especially in a big city. I recommend that people do research, you know, wherever you're located or wherever you're thinking of locating your store or your service, make sure you do your due diligence and find out what kind of competition you have. Who are the phone repair carriers referring customers to? You know, if I called up AT&T and said, hey, I've got a broken screen, I'm not up for a renewal, where do I go to take my phone? And they tell me, oh, you go to John's phone repair store. Now I know that John is the place that AT&T is sending their customers. So I contact John and see what type of business he's running and if he's the type of person that I want to compete with, and when I say that, it has nothing to do with um, you know, whether I like him or not, it has more to do with whether or not he is running his business successfully. So if I saw an opportunity where someone was not servicing their customers, I would be happy to open a store directly across the street from them. But if I see someone who's doing a very good job with his business, he's taking care of his customers, he has competitive rates, he's doing advertising, his online reputation is good, I'm gonna be more likely to start looking at a different area to locate my business. You know, it's just not um, a good idea to put yourself in competition with someone unless you wanna have price wars. And really that doesn't end up benefiting too many people in most cases, in a lot of cases, not even the customer. Now, if you wanna replace iPhone screens and that's it, I say, why not get into the business? I mean, there's very little to risk. You don't, it's not a huge investment to get started, you need a few hand tools, maybe a heat gun, 
uh, a workbench of some sort and some parts, you know, a couple different colors of each model and you're good to go. If you um, are on the fence, you know, thinking, well, this might be for me and it might not, but I really want to make a few extra bucks. I can say most people who fit the qualifications that I mentioned earlier will have no trouble working on iPhones when it comes to screen replacement, at least for the time being. Now, it's become slightly more challenging, but really, uh, a screen is a screen. You take out some screws, you have to deal with the waterproofing seal, but outside of that, replacing the screen is not a big deal. Uh, if you wanna go further than that, though, you will need to get more training and more experience and definitely more equipment. So again, depending on which direction you go, it's going to affect how much money you're gonna to have to invest up front to get started. I do like to ask people whether or not this is something that they are truly interested in because if you don't enjoy this, you're gonna find that a lot of times you're reading about topics that are not interesting to you. So a lot of what we do is look for answers. When we can't figure out why a phone's not working, we don't have a magic 1-800 number that we call up and get an answer. We've got to go and look online. And if you've used Google recently, you've probably noticed that it's become less uh, effective at finding answers. You know, you're more likely to find the history of a question than the answer to the question that you're looking for because we have this thing where if you want to know if 2 plus 2 equals 4, you have to SEO your site to talk all about the history of mathematics instead of just answering the question up front. So uh, your Google foo, as they call it, is going to be a factor. Uh, being able to have access to resources like videos online, forums where they support cell phone repair topics, those are the, gonna be the, the places that you end up spending a lot of your time. So if you weren't interested in really understanding phone repair and really getting good at it and understanding why things work the way they do, you're gonna spend a lot of hours reading about information that is not of interest to you. So I tell people, you know, if that's not your thing, man, you're gonna spend all your time learning about something that you really don't care about other than the, the fact that your business relies on it. So that's not something that I would recommend, really. You will be constantly learning. There is no, I learned everything about cell phones, I'm done. And this is why when people say, well, how long have you been doing this? And I say, you know, I've been doing it for a long time, but that's really not the issue because the moment that I say I know everything there is to know about phone repair, that is that only indicates one thing. That indicates that I am done learning. And when you get to the point where you're done learning, that means you're probably thinking about getting out of the business that you're in because this is a constant learning process. It's an ever-evolving, constantly changing market. Technologies are going to start uh, probably changing even more rapidly now. So. If you're not prepared for that, you're going to be dealing with a lot of frustration. Also, are you willing to market your business? Because if you're in an area that's competitive, and chances are you will be, you've got to get out and talk to people and shake hands or send someone out there to do that on your behalf. If you don't do face-to-face -face marketing, uh, you, can, you, know, you can accomplish so much by doing Facebook and uh making a Yelp page and a Google Plus page and a yellowpages.com page and so forth. But a lot of people are going to bring their phone to you because someone recommended your service. And you know, one truth that has not changed to my knowledge is that word of mouth is still the best advertising. So if you do a good job for someone, they are much more likely to recommend someone to come into your business. And if you're dealing with online reputation management, you're gonna be running into all sorts of weird stuff because people want to ruin your reputation. You're gonna have your competition, you're gonna have customers that wanted to get things for less than what you are charging them for. You might have someone with a personal vendetta against you. You're gonna have all sorts of factors that are going to affect what people learn about your business from online sources. So you wanna do your best that you can to make sure that the real face-to-face -face interactions in the stores and the people who are your former customers talking to other potential customers are all positive. That they say, you know what? I don't care what you read online about this business. This guy's terrible and this guy's great or whatever it is. You know, I, I read stuff online all the time. They say this restaurant is terrible. I go there and try it for myself and I figure, eh, you know what? Most of the people that wrote the negative reviews had some sort of ax to grind. So I really don't give much credit to that anymore, but a lot of people do. So online reputation is gonna be another area where you have to be willing to invest your time and follow up and answer complaints and questions because no matter how good you are, someone is going to complain about what you're doing. Yeah, see the comment at the beginning of the video. And I'm not bragging, I just think it's funny. You know, you make a video to try to help people, you will definitely get some comments, some down votes, some negative comments, whatever, you know, it's all good. Uh, they're happy, 
I got entertainment out of it. You know, no complaints. That's the way the world is. Is this business ever going to go away? Uh, you know, anything's possible, but it seems unlikely in the near future. Everyone has a phone or more than one phone. And there are also several branches that you can uh, move into outside of phone repair. Once you have the basics of phone repair and you understand how the customer interaction works and how to run the business and how to manage your inventory and so forth and what the procedures are, you can move into more advanced level repairs like micro soldering, LCD refurbishing. You can go into uh, forensic data, re data recovery. Uh, you can even make a YouTube channel and make videos. Don't expect to get paid a lot of money for that though because it doesn't pay much. Really, it doesn't pay much. In fact, if you wanna make money on videos with cell phones, you should be destroying them, not fixing them, Figured that out a long time ago. That's what people want to see. Can I make a lot of money doing repairs? Um, yes, you can. Uh, but again, all these things that I'm talking about here are going to add up to whether you succeed, fail, uh, succeed greatly, or fail horribly. And much of it is going to come down to the effort that you put into your business. Can you get trained to repair phones, go open up a store, and the day you open the door, you're making tons of money? Probably not. Uh, you know, outside of very limited situations, that usually doesn't happen. And in fact, this is the type of business that builds over time. So a lot of people have started this business in this business uh, with the expectation that they would just be going nuts, you know, making money hand over fist within the first 60 days, 90 days. That's not usually how it works. I would realistically say a good six to six months to a year will really show you where you're at in this business. So it does take a while for that to build up. And it's unfortunate. You can blow a bunch of money on advertising if you want to. But um, my experience has been that the things that cost the least are the most effective. And that's getting out and doing the marketing yourself, talking to people, shaking hands, you know, making friends with the people who are going to send you customers is going to go far more than any amount of money you want to invest in. Uh, AdWords or Yelp advertising uh, or anything like that. You know, there's a lot of ways to waste your money. Please do the basic stuff. And if you can't succeed by marketing your business and by talking to people, all the money that you spend on advertising is probably just going to cost you a lot more. At least when you're out there talking to people, it's your time and not money out of your pocket. Also, do good work. This is the number one way you can succeed. And you know, if someone opened up a business tomorrow and as long as I know it's there, if they're doing something right and I need their services, I'm going to keep going back. But, you know, that's the simplest answer I can give you. If you do good work, people will use your services. You've just got to spread the word and let people know that you're there. So even to this day in, you know, some of our retail locations, after being open for seven years, almost eight years, people will walk in and say, wow, I wish I knew you guys were here. And that's a failure on our end. They should know that we're there. But had we done you know, enough marketing, hopefully the word would have got out to them. But if you don't, they don't know you're there. It doesn't matter what you have. So one, do good work. Number two, let people know that you exist and it's very difficult to fail. You know, in spite of all the competition, there are a lot of people who jump into this industry not knowing very much and thinking that, well, you know, I can change a screen on a phone and I'll do it cheaper than the other guy. Well, obviously there is a catch to that. You don't just start doing things cheaper than other people and succeed and, and you know, they're over there going, well, I can't compete with the price. Well, if they can't compete with the price, then obviously you're cutting corners somewhere. So. There, there are two different levels in my, you know, two main categories for this business. There are people who are willing to work cheap and that includes using cheap parts and doing cheap work and not being reliable and not offering much of a warranty and any number of things. And in some cases that's okay because if someone is just trading their phone in, they will, so they'll come in and say, Hey, I want to spend the least amount of money that it takes. And I don't care as long as it works, I'm trading this thing in tomorrow. So that's fine if that's what you're after. But a lot of people will come in looking for a repair with the intention of continuing to use that phone and rely on that phone and not having their data become corrupt or just disappear because the phone dies. And that's where we have chosen, you know, that's kind of the path that we have chosen is do the best possible work that you can, use the best quality parts that you can, uh, avoid most of the headaches that you possibly can, and most people are happy with that. And if they say, you know what, I just, I don't want to spend that much money, I'm just trying to give this phone back to the carrier, okay, well, I've got a cheap aftermarket screen here in the back, and I can match that guy's price down the hall, but I can't put my, my warranty, uh, you know, on that cheap piece of equipment. 
So if you want a six month warranty or you want a six or a one year warranty, you're not going to get it for the same price as the guy down the hall who does it with a 30 day warranty using some cheap aftermarket part. It's plain and simple. You know, that's the way it is. And in fact, I hesitate even at a discounted rate to put my name on anything that isn't OEM or OEM quality. Because if you start doing discounted stuff, no matter what you tell the customer, no matter what, what steps you take to explain to them, hey, this isn't what we normally do. You know, we usually have a much higher standard of quality for our parts, but we're doing this because because you wanted it cheap and, you, you know, so forth. You can explain that until you're blue in the face. And at the moment that they have a problem with that device, they're going to tell everybody how much you suck and that you use cheap parts, even though that's what they insisted on. So just something to be aware of. I like to tell people up front what to expect realistically when you go down that route. And by the way, you're going to run into a lot of competition who will come and go and they'll have a lot of upset customers and they will ruin their own reputation. So you don't really have to worry about them because they do generally destroy themselves over time. Uh, you know, if not, because of the poor quality parts, but because of poor management, poor customer service skills, and so forth. And this is another thing that I like to talk to people about, and that is customer service. Because if you get into this business thinking, well, I enjoy technology, I like I, you know mechanical stuff, I can work with the electronics, this is great. There is another side to this business entirely, and that is dealing with the public. So uh, again, you know, referencing what happened in the beginning five, six years ago before phone repair really was as big as it is now, a lot of people would open up a shop, be the only game in town, and they could run their business any way they wanted to. And they could basically treat their customers just about any way they wanted to because there was no other option. And as cable companies are finding out today, you can do that for so long until there's an alternative and then you're going to be punished for it, okay? So all these things where you said, well, we'll be at your house between eight and five o'clock tomorrow and if you don't like it, too bad, we're the only cable company. That's not the case anymore. A lot of people have alternatives. So they're seeing that come back to haunt them. And if you run, that, if you run your business that way from day one, don't be surprised if someone opens up a shop later on and everyone says, okay, see ya, thanks, you know, we don't need you anymore. So, you know, you kind of dig your own grave if you go that route. There's also kind of a philosophy of giving things away to make people happy. So this is, again, you know, something that's, uh, I, I should say controversial because, you know, I talk to people a lot within the industry and there are kind of two frames of mind. And one is that we're gonna do the best possible work that we can and we're going to charge you accordingly. And the other one is that, well, you know, we're going to do whatever we can to make the customer happy, even if that means giving him a bunch of free stuff because he doesn't want to spend, you know, the amount of money that we're asking for this repair. So let me just take something out of the air. So let's say I, I tell you I charge $99 for this repair. And with that repair, you get the highest quality work that I can possibly do, you know, that I'm aware of. And you get a one year warranty on the repair and you get an OEM quality part. And I'm going to, you know, give you all this information about what it is that you're buying. So you go, okay, um, I'm going to check with the guy down the street. And you go to the guy down the street and you say, hey, you know, this other guy said he's going to do the repair for $99. What can you do? And the guy behind the counter knows that he should be charging that same amount of money in order to make a profit. And, you know, considering what his parts cost and his time invested in is going to be and what his warranty is going to be and so forth. But he says, well, I'll tell you what, I'll do it for $99 plus I'll throw in a screen protector and a case. Well, that is a better deal for you as a customer. But what he's done is said, well, you know, I am not willing to change my price on the repair, but I'm willing to give away some free stuff to close the deal. And if 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 it comes down to a screen protector that costs you five dollars and it's whether or not you're going to get the deal right then and there, that's fine. That's absolutely at your option. But if you don't put some sort of limit on how far you're willing to go and let's say your cost on that screen is sixty nine dollars and you were making a $30 profit, and then you throw in a $5 you know, screen protector that cost you $5, and you throw in a case that cost you $10, well, pretty soon you're at the point where you're not really making any money in order to get that customer to do business with you. And what you will find over time, and this is probably one of the number one things that I've heard back from people when they say, wow, I wish I had listened to you in the first place. And that is, if you give away stuff to have the lowest price to make people happy because they don't really want to spend the amount of money that you are asking, what you will do is create an environment where you have a whole bunch of people coming to you not willing to spend money. Whereas, you know, in the first scenario, if the guy says, well, look, I'm going to give you the best possible service, workmanship, 
quality part and so forth and I stake my reputation on the line people know I could do good work but this is the price for it he is going to end up getting customers who are looking for high quality work and they're going to expect it and they're going to hold you to those promises that you made but as long as you're doing your job right you should have nothing to worry about and your customer should have nothing to worry about whereas the other person who maybe isn't able to compete with you on a quality level but is willing to reduce their price to make up for it is going to get all of the customers who don't want to spend the appropriate amount of money for the work that they're getting. So basically the people who don't spend money are going to go to him and the people that understand the value of what they're getting and are okay with paying the price are going to go to the first guy. So everyone's happy really. The guy who's willing to work cheap is getting paid very little and the guy that's willing to do good work for the right price is getting paid what he asks. So there you go. That problem kind of takes care of itself. Last but not least, the best piece of advice I can give to anyone, no matter what sort of business you're in, and that is not to limit yourself to one revenue stream. Uh, things are changing rapidly and a lot of people who have far more education than I do are looking for jobs or are working in really crappy jobs that they don't like and that they're overqualified for. So. You know, the way things are going, we are moving towards a gig economy. Uh, job security is kind of becoming a thing of the past and even government jobs, which were very reliable historically, are being questioned with the new administration. You know, it, there may be a lot of people who are out of work who are counting on their retirement and, you know, who knows, uh, very sad. Uh, these kind of things will happen eventually, um, depending on what's going on economically and politically speaking. So it is good to protect yourself against this kind of stuff make sure that you have more than one way to make money because you know tomorrow if apple says well you know we give you one free repair on every phone that you buy well that is going to cut into your revenue big time if samsung makes a phone that cannot be repaired you know there's no way for us to do it um, we're not going to be able to work on samsung so these are things to consider i don't believe that's going to be what happens but anything's possible so the more ways that you can find to generate money from your business the better don't rely on anything nowadays Nothing is really that secure.